Hello and welcome to your advanced reverse engineering. This homework. The homework was to construct program slices. And your slice is, is pretty simple. We're going to assume that REX is live at the return and you need to slice backward to figure out what goes in there. <clears throat> so you will uh, construct the backward slice of the block based on the value of REX immediately prior to the return. If a member of the care set is written by an instruction, you keep that instruction, otherwise you discard it. If an instruction is kept, then you discard the L values first, and then you add all the R values second to the care set. And that will be what you need to do. If you ever hit a place where the set's empty, you're done. You're immediately done. You can just stop right there. Uh, at the end of the backward slice, I want you to print out any remaining care set as on entry and uh, and that's what you'll what you'll do so if we look at the program over there you'll see we'll be able to make our way all the way back to the beginning we still have a non-empty care set uh, it's RDI so if we want to know what the return value is at the end of that little piece of code we need to know what RDI is at the beginning of it all right don't think that's too super challenging if you'd like to see how this works, here's output from my little slice program. Once this is turned in, I'll put, post my slice program in uh, the extras. Uh, we're not using fee functions, but you might ask yourself how you would use fee functions. Not as hard as you might think. Uh, and I don't worry about skipping the return. You can, you can read this and convince yourself that it's fine. Let's talk about Mycroft's stuff. So there's there's our fellow again, co-founder of the Raspberry Pi Foundation and his uh, paper type-based decompilation. And we talked about his intuitive example last time, but now let's look at a larger example of it. So there's some code over on the right. And this is not the little trivial program we had before, but it's not super complicated either. It's sort of enough to let us see uh, some control flow, some conditionals, etc. So we'll see some other stuff going on in here. So up at the front, up at the top, he gives you a little C program, and his claim is that he's compiled that to the code at the bottom. Now, you might look at the stuff at the top and look at the stuff at the bottom and wonder how do those things relate? You know, I, I don't necessarily see it immediately. Alright, so I want you to understand this paper, it's an important paper. Let's go through it just for fun. Let's take that C program and let's compile it. <laughs> compile it by hand, because why not? Uh, all right, we're gonna use his RTL to do it. There's our friend, the C program. Now, I'm gonna stick it up there in the corner and I'm gonna rewrite it a little bit. So I've, I've spread the little uh, for loop along multiple lines there. Now, Here's a little bit of C trivia. So you hopefully you've thought about that for loop and how that works and what it does, what it really does. And my question for you is, can I move the int r equals zero inside the loop's initialization? If you look, you'll see the initialization for the loop, that first part, right before the first semicolon, is empty. Could I, could I move int r equals zero inside the initialization? Can I do that? And the answer is no, I can't. Because I have to declare R at the top level so that I can return it down here. If I declare it inside the loop body here, it's only valid inside the loop. Didn't know if you knew that or not, but the scope of variables declared uh, inside the for loop here is limited to the for loop itself. Now I could declare R up here and set it to zero here, but I can't declare it in here. What about this thing, x plus equal x hat? Could I move that inside the for loop? And if I did, where the heck would it go? Turns out I can do that. I could do that just fine. I could move that immediately prior to setting x to its tail and separate them by a comma, and that would work. Just pure C trivia. It's always helpful to know more about the programming language you use. Let's pull out that loop 
There's the entire loop right there. And we're going to transform it uh, slightly so that we can do the compilation. And the first thing we're going to do is convert it to a while loop. So our condition remains the same. While x is not equal to 0, we then do the body of the loop r plus equal x head and then we do the iteration x gets x tail and that's it. There was no initialization so we had to worry about that. Is that true? This says, right, if the while predicate is initially false we never do the body. Is that true for a for loop in C? It is. It is true. All right, so we've successfully converted our for loop to a while loop. Hmm, still not super obvious, but let's unroll it once. So I unroll it once, and I get a do while, which is a much more assembly-ish structure. You'll see that a lot in assembly. So now I have a condition. I have if x is not equal to zero, then do the body, and then keep doing the body while x is not equal to zero. That's a much more assembly-esque structure. And in fact, that's the structure I want in order to get the output that he shows us. It may have been obvious to him when he wrote the paper. It wouldn't necessarily be obvious to you. So I want to go through that and be sure you understand. We initialize r to zero. And in his little language, uh, we do that by moving a constant zero into r1. Uh, so R1 turns out to be our R, and we can note that assignment over on the far right-hand side there. You'll see I have, I have R1 gets R. Then I check to see if X is not zero, and I have a compare there. That tips me off that X is going to be in R0, and I kind of already knew that because this calling convention, if you remember, was that that the arguments go in R0 and then R1 and R2, etc. And the return value is in R0. So I, I sort of already knew that. Uh, but this just further confirms it. So I now have R0 gets X, R1 gets R. And I can note those two things over on the right hand side. Now, of course, I'm noting that for now, it's assembly. I can move stuff around in registers. But that's what we're going to assume for right now. We just know where those things are, and that's convenient. Then, well, I'll go back for a moment and say, what if that can? What if that turns out that R0 is 0? Then I branch if equal to L4F2. That's down here. And I exit. Otherwise, I come into the body of the loop, right? Because if you look down at the bottom, I check the condition, and then I do the body. It's not obvious from this that that's what happens. But it is obvious from this structure down here. The body says, add to R the head of the linked list. And so I go up here and grab that. If you look at the structure, the head is the, is the first thing in there. The tail is the second thing. So we can expect the head to be at offset 0. And so in his little notation, we say R is 0, which we know is x. We then get the head, which knows an offset 0 from that, and we put that into R2. Now, now, wait a minute. What's R2? R2 is just a temporary scratch register we're using uh, as we accumulate. And so then we're going to add R2 and R1 and store the result in R1. So we get the head, and then we add it into our accumulator, which is R which is R1. So there we go. That do, those two assembly lines do the body of the loop. Now we have to do the iteration statement. You'll see down at the bottom, x gets its tail. And how do we do that? Well, we're assuming that an int is four bytes long. And so we would expect to find the tail at offset four. Uh, in modern C on a 64-bit machine, that might not be true. We might, sure enough, have a four-byte integer at the start. But then, because of alignment, we might have that eight-byte uh, tail located at offset eight. 
and waste four bytes for every uh, entry in the table. And in fact, the, the compiler might try to optimize it for it. Maybe it moves the tail uh, up to the start when it lays it out, puts the head at the end to conserve space. Who knows what it does? It can do almost anything. We can use certain declarations to acquire that it pack them, so it packs tighter, or, or we can do other stuff with it, cause them to be aligned in different ways. But here, we're assuming there are four bytes, and so we expect to find the tails pointer at offset four in R0, and we copy that into R0. Literally X gets its tail. Now I check to see again if R0 is zero. That's our second check down here at the bottom for the while loop. And if it's not equal, I branch up to the top and keep going. Otherwise, I come down here and I return R. My accumulator was R1. My return value is R0, so I just move R1 into R0 and return. So there you go. So I hope this made sense to you. This is why you start out with, I think it has one compare, but you wind up with two compares when you compile it. And just some, some weirdness there, and I wanted you to understand that. We want to convert this to static single assignment form. That's the first thing we need to do uh, to apply his method. When we have branching, we need to implement fee functions at the join points. So let's get a flow graph for it. Here's the flow graph for that code. And, uh, and so I've got boxes that are functions, I've got diamonds that are predicates, and I've got these little circles which indicate places where the flow merges. And I gave him the, the names of the labels in his code. Places where it merges. There you go, merge points. There'll be the little circles. It's really simple. If you draw your flow graph with circles, it, there you go, you're, d you're done. Okay, so we know where the merge points are. And now we need fee functions. And we need one fee function for each live variable. So let's go to the very end. The only variable that's live is going to be R1. Is that right? Well, yeah, because we are going to overwrite R0 with the contents of R1. Keep in mind, we're doing things, the order of operands is backwards from what you've been getting used to. So we're going to take R1 and move it into R0, overriding and losing that value so R0 won't be alive, but R1 will be. We'll need R1 in order to determine the return value. So we need to know what the value is there. And we might arrive at L4F2 either on the path from that initial branch if equal, or we might arrive on the false branch from that last branch if not equal. And so we'll say that's you know, R1 sub 1 and R1 sub 2, depending on how we get there. Working our way back up, we come into the loop. We come into the body of the loop. And both R1 and R0 are live there. So I'll need a fee function for both of them. So I need a fee function for R0 and a fee function for R1. Same logic applies. I might arrive at L3F2 from that branch if equals false branch, or I might arrive after just having executed the body of the loop. And I'll just pick the right one using that fee function. So I put the fee functions in, they go in right where the merge points are, and there they are. And I now am ready to start uh, doing the static single assignment stuff. Let's do that. So we're going to add an, a letter at the end. A million different ways to do static single assignment. We'll see yet another one before the class is over, before the uh, whole class is over. We'll see it when we get to uh, concurrent execution. So we're going to just stick, a, in this case, a letter on the end. Sticking a number on the end is weird, right? R0 sub 0. In this case, we'll just say R0A. So I'll take the initial R0 and I'll put it in the new one, and that's R0A. I'll move the literal 0 into R1, and that's R1A, and I can flow through, and I can put you know, R0A in that next spot. In that fee function, I can put R0A in the first slot. I can put R1A in the first slot, because those are the values that will arrive from that top part. 
that the very I might also take that branch of equal and go to the bottom, in which case that carries the value R1A down there, and so I put it in the first slot of that phi function. Then I begin to populate the body, and I can put R0B and R1B in there as a result of evaluating the phi functions. I then populate those through the body where they go. I continue on, uh, and now I know what goes in the second slot. Uh, if I come back from the bottom, I'll have R0C and R1C, and so I put those in. If I flow down from that middle block to the bottom, I'll have R1C, and so I pop those in. And now, I'm almost done. I take care of the stuff at the very end, and I am done. The program is now in static single assignment form. So R1B has a particular value. It'll always have that value. It's the only value it ever has, for example. So now we can apply his type reconstruction rules. So we look at each line, we match it against one of those lines there, and then we apply the generated constraint. And all the constraints have to be simultaneously true uh, for any solution. The first one is the move, matches that one, and from that we would get that constraint. So if I'm moving R4 into R6, I get T6 is T4. I'm moving R0 into R0A, so I'd get type 0A is equal to type 0. There we go. I continue to apply in that same model and get the same thing. Notice that for that next one, I'm moving a 0 in, and he takes the the point of view that zero could be an integer, it could be a null, it could be a pointer. And so I'm allowed to have that type be either an integer or a pointer to some as yet unknown type. And so I'll put an alpha, it's a one in there. We continue on. The next one is the same thing, except it could be a pointer to a different type. I don't know, so I'll call it alpha sub two. And then finally we get to that LDW, load word. And now, you notice I have that pointer to memory with offset, and I know the offset's zero, so I fill that in, and I wind up with that line. I continue on until I've filled them all in, and now I have a system of constraints. If I had a system that could solve those constraints, all right, I could plug all those constraints in and say, give me a T0A and a T0, and a T1A, and a T0A, and so on, that satisfies those constraints. That when I plug those values in, it makes all of the constraints simultaneously true. And that would be a solution for that. So I still need to annotate the function itself. What is the argument? It's of type T0. What's the return value? It's of type T0D, right? So. What he does, for reasons I don't entirely get, but this is what he does, he calls the, he renames the return value T99, and so T99 is T0D, and his type for the whole thing, T sub F, or type of the function, is T0 gets, uh, T0 as the argument, and then that produces the T99. So it's a little function notation there. System of equations. Can we find solutions? So we talked about making them all simultaneously true. Maybe there is nothing that does that. What, that, what does that mean when there's no solution? If there's just one solution, great. That's our one solution. What if there are many solutions? Well, there will be many solutions. We'll see an example of that later. But, but for right now, you know, I don't know. Let's see what happens when we try to solve it. So we go through this process of solving it, and it's a little convoluted and can be hard to follow. So let's walk through a little bit of that. So line five tells us that T0B and T0C are the same. Seven tells us that T0B has to be a pointer to a certain type. And nine tells us that T0B has to be a pointer of a different type. Notice these are both giving us partial information. 
T0B is a, is a pointer such that memory at 0 has type 2A, T, and it's also a pointer such that memory at offset 4 has type T0C. Those two things are both true, okay? So it's telling us bits and pieces. There could be more to it. There could be other stuff in there. It might be something like at offset 8. We don't know. All we know so far are those couple of things. Now, there's a problem associated with this, which is that we know T0C is something, but we have the case that T0C actually depends on T0C. We have a recursive type. And this fails the rule he calls a curve check. Because what he's doing is he's just saying, does the type I'm defining occur in its definition? And if it does, that's bad. I don't want that. So I'm going to have a hard time doing type unification and doing lots of other stuff because T0C also appears on the... I haven't, got a, I haven't got a base case for this. There's no basis case for this. And that's bad. So I need to have a way to solve that. And the way he comes up to solve it is he says, hey, look, those have different offsets. Let's make a struct. And so he makes a struct. And the first thing is T2, a type, something of type T2A. The second thing is of something of type T0C. That satisfies his little uh, offsets. And we'll call that struct G. And now I can say T0C equals T0B. Right, we got that from line 5 equals a pointer to these two things which fails a curse check but then I replace it with a, with the structure which also fails a curse check but then I finally replace that with struct G. Struct G does not fail a curse check because I've hidden the T0C from me I don't see it anymore. So there we go. Now I've, I've passed a curse check and I'm good. And along the way, I've invented the structure. Okay, new expression passes the curse check just because T0B, those characters in that order, don't appear on the right hand side of that equation. Great, so we can hear it to solve. From, from 11, 12, and 13, we can conclude that. Really? 13 tells us T99 is T0D, 12 tells us T0D is T1D. And 11 tells us that T1D is T1A, and T1D is also T1C. It has to be simultaneously those two. All right, fine. Continuing, we now use line 6. So that first line you see there is from the slide we just saw, this slide right here. We copied over here, and what does line 6 tell us? It tells us that T1C is also t one B, so we replace it with that. T1B is also T1A, replace it with that, and from that we conclude they must all be the same. There you go. T99 is T0D, is T1D, is T1A, is T1B, is T1C. Boom. From line 8, there's line 8, that's a long three uh, part line. We know since T1B and T1C have to be the same, we have to pick the line that allows them to be the same. Well, the, the, the first one lets T1B and T1C uh, be different things, right? T1B is an int, T1C is a pointer. Eh, it won't work. The second line says T1B is a pointer and T1C is a pointer. That'll work, they're the same. The next line says T1B is an int and T1C is an int. That'll work, they're the same. So we can reduce the condition in 8 to just those two atoms that are still allowed. So we conclude that T99 must be either an int or a pointer. Right? How do we get there? Previous line, right? T1B is an int or T or it's a pointer, one of those two. T1B we know is equal to T99, so there you go. What can we conclude about T0, the input at the very top? We apply the same reasoning there. Lines 2 and 5 uh, tell us that T0 is T0A, which is T0B. We know that that's going to be the pointer to the struct by the prior result. So we know that T0 
is a pointer to a structure, a struct G. And so we wind up with that type for the function. Uh, it takes in as an argument a pointer to a struct and it gives us back either a pointer or an integer. Well, that pointer type introduces a new type, alpha 4, we never figured out. It just makes things hard. So let's get rid of it. And we now wind up with, we take in a pointer and we return an integer. There we go. And so that's how he does that. Now, let's think about this in the x86-64 world, or the AMD-64 world. Different compilers produce very different outputs. Some will optimize away the stack frame stuff, for example. Some will eliminate intermediate results. Um, we're going to try a program with GCC and Clang and a few optimization levels. I think it's worth doing this because it helps illustrate uh, some of how this stuff works. So there's a program. It's our same one from Mycroft. It's Mycroft's program. Uh, and we compile it using GCC. And we get something that's 54 bytes long that you see over on the right hand side. And notice I didn't turn on any optimization, so I have all those pointers with the intermediate values being stored. And two loops. Well, what if I turn on optimization? Oh, I get a much prettier piece of code. It's only 33 bytes long, and you can see that it's got two loops in it. It has two returns and some knobs in it, but surely by now we're used to seeing that kind of stuff. What if I optimize it for space? Oh, then it figures out, hey, I can reuse some previous code. I only need one test as opposed to two, and I can combine the returns. I don't need to try to align memory. I'll just squeeze it down as much as I can. By eliminating the memory alignment constraint, we wind up with, with a different type of code. The memory alignment constraints what gave us the two returns and all the knops, right? The first knop is in there so that the target of the branch is on 10. The second knop is in there so the target of the other branch is on 20. Why not just fall through to that last return? Well, because I got to load more instructions. So I immediately return at the end of the loop or I return at the branch and they wind up being different returns because of alignment. If I take that away, simpler piece of code. That's GCC. What about Clang? Well, if I do Clang-O, basic optimization, uh, it's going to give me 28 bytes, and you'll see it gives me the code over there on the right. If I give it an OZ, I can get it down to 16 bytes. Why am I shorter in Clang than I was in GCC? That's because Clang does not yet implement branch protection, so there's no NBR64 at the beginning. Let's pick the intermediate version, the dash O2 version. And it looks a lot like my cross code. Uh, we'll clean it up a bit. Uh, so right now we've got some knops in there. We've got two returns. Let's clean this up a bit. Let's get rid of extraneous addresses. Let's get rid of the knops. Let's merge the two returns. Boom, there's the piece of code we'll work with. And we'll just pretend that's right. Um, and so we'll consider the program flow. There is the program flow for our little piece of code. And unsurprisingly, it looks just like the flow from my cross code. We need to find the merge points. And there they are right there. We'll create fee functions in those two spots. We'll need a fee function for EAX and one for RDI for that first one. And we get that by looking at what's needed in the body. And we'll need a fee function for EAX as a return value in that second one. We add the fee functions. And now, you notice I've named the slots as opposed to putting something in them, right? EAX from above, EAX from below, RDF from above or below, EAX from top, EAX from fall through. And so as we do our, uh, our static single assignment, we'll fill those in. And we'll put numbers on the end for this one just because it's convenient to do that. So we put numbers on the first ones and we fill in the first slots of the few functions because we know those now. We put some other numbers in, just fill the rest of them in and we fill in the slots of the few functions that we figure those out. This should look very much like the Mycroft version. And there we go. Program returns the value in EX4. The argument to the program is in RDI, which is RDI zero. 
So the, func the function's signature is whatever the type of REI0 is, and we return whatever the type of EX4 is. And I'll use T with parentheses, uh, unlike what Mycroft does of trying to stick a T at the beginning. I, I just think that's easier. So there's our uh, first constraint. We are exclusive ordering EX1 and EX0, and Mycroft actually has a constraint for that, and so that tells us that the two have to be the same. Now, is that right? Well, there's not enough bits for a pointer. EX is not enough bits for a pointer, but but maybe I'm exclusive ordering it with itself because I want to set it to a pointer to null. So it's effectively the same thing as moving a zero in there, which Mycroft does acknowledge could be a pointer. So we've already found one potential problem with Mycroft's very simple approach. That's okay. It's easy to fix, right? Mycroft's tried to do something that would fit into a paper. An uh, implementation of this would have to take into account other things. And in this case, eh, maybe, maybe it's not an int. Okay. Maybe what I should do is, and the other thing I don't tell you is whether it's signed or unsigned. Maybe it's a signed int. Maybe it's an unsigned int. Mycroft didn't tell us about that. But we'll take, in, if we take that into account here and we'll say maybe it's an int 32t, maybe it's a uint 32t. Could be a pointer, but we already kind of know it's not, so let's not worry about that. You know about standard int.h by now. There you go. From the next line, we're testing RDI with itself. We're comparing it to zero. And so we know from Mycroft we have to consider the case that it might be a pointer. And then the answer question, oh sorry, the question is pointer to what? Well, I don't know. Let's call it A for right now. It could also be a 64-bit signed or unsigned integer, right? Those have the right number of bits. We'll put those in as possibilities as well. It's one of those. Now we come down here and we have the fee functions. And from those, I know that the type of EX2 has to be the type of EX1 and it has to be the type of EX3. Now this is tricky here. Uh, again, note that Steensgaard wouldn't like this. He would say, no, that you're assuming too much. But, you know, Mycroft says, no, I'm assuming just the right amount. Fine. We'll, we'll go with Mycroft here. Uh, and notice that for, I do the same thing for RDI. They all have to be the same type because I have to be able to assign them to RDI. Now we wind up with these two little guys. Uh, I add into EAX3 what I get looking at RDI's memory. So I look at the memory at location RDI plus zero, and I'm gonna write that with a little at symbol. I don't, I'm not gonna write it with the number in front of the brackets. I'm going to say, you know, it's the it's uh, the type of EX3 stored at offset 0 and the type of RDI2 stored at offset 8. I just find that a little more clear. But we have those two pieces. Then we have uh, another case where it might be an integer, or it might be a pointer, I don't know. And then we have the final case where EX4 is EX1 is EX3. And notice we still can't tell if it's signed or unsigned. We just don't know. So what we're going to do is we're going to say it's signed. I'm just going to make the arbitrary distinction or decision and say it's a signed value. Boom, I'm done. RDI2 is clearly a pointer. Is it really? Sure. If we if we look up here, uh, RDI 0 could potentially be a pointer, right? RDI 0 is the same as the type of RDI 1. Type of RDI 0 is the same as the type of RDI 1. Our type of RDI 1 is, in fact, a pointer. That means that the type of RDI 0 must also be a pointer. Boom. So we'll just resolve that. And 
we can apply the same kind of logic for RDI2 because RDI0, which we know is a pointer, is the same as the type of RDI2. So we can resolve that guy as well. Boom, int A. There we go. So now we know some stuff. Uh, right, we can fill in a few more things. <clears throat> and we've made some progress, but we also have the same problem he did before. If you look, you'll see that the type of RDI2 is a pointer to uh, A. We know A is what is being pointed to by RDI2, which is RDI1, which has RDI2 in it. So if we write it up at the top, you'll see, oops, we have a, we have a problem. We failed a curse check. That's okay, because we can go ahead and create a structure just like he did, and we're good. Maybe a little thrown by me claiming that it fails a curse check. Remember that RDI2 and RDI3 are the same, so the presence of RDI3 here and the presence of RDI3 here means we fail. So now I've called my structure X, and so now I have struct X. And I have, so I can replace that with some struct X's. There's some weirdness going on in there. Let's clean that middle section up a bit. Uh, and we'll make that look a little prettier. So finally we end up with the program signature. The only argument is RDI. We have the type of RDI. One is a pointer to a struct X. The return value is REX. And we have the type of REX as an int 32 underscore T. And we're done. That's it. That's how his larger example works. And that's how you can apply this for, uh, if I give you some assembly, let's say on the final, how you would apply it. For homework, it's due on uh, 23rd of November, new homework. It is to take an elf binary and find the basic blocks in it. Okay, to do this, you're gonna run in two passes. Now, the first pass, you're going to find leaders. In the second pass, you're going to print basic blocks for each of those leaders in order. How does this work? There's an algorithm in some of the previous slides, but you know, if you don't want that, here's the quick uh, summary here. Pass one, go and find leaders. Where do you start? Do you just load it, grab the text section, and then start sweeping through the text section? No, do not do that. We're gonna find code that's reachable. To find code that's reachable, we have to find the place from which it is reached. So I want you to start at main. Okay, so you're gonna use your heuristic that finds main and that's where you're gonna start. What if the heuristic fails and you don't find main? In that case, start from the entry point. The entry point's not the first address in text, not necessarily, right? Go and find the entry point and start there. It can be very important that you're able to get an instruction at a particular address. So you'll need to remember, slice the data array, set the address correctly, build a new dis disasm uh, generator every time you need to switch the address, okay? If you're just marching through instructions in order, fine, just call next repeatedly or use in a loop. But then when you've got to go somewhere else, rebuild that disassembly thing at the new address. All right, how does this algorithm work? Go to find main. If you can't find main, use start. Put that on a stack. Then, while the stack is not empty, pop the thing off the top of the stack, and then go and grab the approximate basic block at that location. That is, sweep through and grab all the instructions that could be part of that basic block. And for every one of those that gives you a new leader, record that basic block leader, okay? And then, push all those basic block leaders onto the stack. And then, while the stack's not empty, grab the next one off. And if you haven't already explored it, go and explore it and add more leaders, okay? When the stack is empty, you're done. You'll wanna keep a list of leaders around so you can always tell if you have explored one previously or not. And so you have a final list of leaders. Sort it by uh, order numerically and then for each one of those, actually extract and print the basic block at that location. And now you can stop when you encounter a leader because now you know where all the leaders are. 
I hope that makes sense. This tells you about basic blocks, and that's it. If you have questions, let me know. Take care.